Well, thank you everyone for coming on a Thursday. I know the week and the term is just flying by so quickly. So thank you for coming out. Um, I'll just remind people that for the Q&A portion, wait till you get the microphone so everyone streaming can hear the questions that are asked. Uh, I'll come around with those. But I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert, Bol uh, sorry, Dr. Robert Butler, uh, who grew up in a small town in Utah. He received his bachelor's from BYU-Idaho and completed his master's and PhD for, at Auburn University. His internship was at University of New Mexico. He's taught for four years at King's College in Pennsylvania before coming to teach here with us in 2016 at EOU. I was married to Trina Macbeth in 2005, and they have five amazing kids, ages three, five, seven, nine, 11. You really like prime numbers, I think, for now. <laughs> he loves uh, to play racquetball and basketball, so if anyone is looking for a friend, there you go. I'll turn it over. Right. That racquetball. <laughs> the racquetball piece is really important because you always have to find good racquetball partners. But anyway, uh, in my research, I have two main areas of research that I've done throughout the years. One is on parenting practices, and one is on religion and prejudice. And unfortunately, I don't do as much research on parenting as I would like to because. The main reason I do a lot of my research is to get my undergraduates to conferences and get them publications. And unfortunately, the parenting research tends to take several years to complete. And so this area of research is something that we can get done in a relatively brief time so the students can present at conferences and get publications before they go to graduate school if they want to. So uh, yeah, let's go. just go ahead and get started. So I try to think about something funny or witty to say. I'm like, eh, I couldn't think of anything. I wasn't being creative last night when I was thinking about this. So I decided to tell you a little bit about my journey of how I got to this topic. So my area in psychology is I'm a child clinical psychologist, and this research is very much in the social psychology realm. So it's not exactly a perfect alignment with where my uh, training was. And so the way I got here, though, was in graduate school, I was doing my master's in autism spectrum disorders. And working with kids with autism is amazing and the research is great, but again, that's an area where the research takes a very long time to complete, generally speaking. And as I was looking at doing my master's degree, I thought, I'd like to finish my master's and my PhD before I turn like 60. So I decided to go with a topic that I could complete in a shorter amount of time than actually doing research on autism therapies. And so what I end up selling on is I notice a lot of my clients who are higher functioning, who have autism, experience a lot of prejudice in their lives. And so we did a nice research study on prejudice towards adults with Asperger's disorder, what we called it back then instead of high functioning autism. But anyway, we did this research study and kind of got my mind thinking about prejudice. And then after that, we had our qualifying exams. And at Auburn, for our qualifying exams, we were given uh, six questions, you wrote 20 pages on each question, you turned them in, and then your committee grilled you on them. And one of the questions that my committee gave me was to review the literature on reliability and validity of measures of religiosity, so a very kind of stark question within religion. And I did that paper and I turned it in. Well, when I was defending my qualifying exams, one of the doctors there who was grilling me on if I learned my stuff asked a question that was very kind of off topic for the question. So the question was about psychometrics, how do you measure religion? And he asked me, as a therapist, and knowing that you are personally religious, how do you address religion in therapy? Like, oh, <laughs> that's completely a different aside, but I gave him my answer, and he was not happy with my answer. He became very combative. And fortunately for me, one of the other doctors who was also on the committee said, I'm very religious and I've been practicing therapy for 20 years and that's exactly how I'd answer the question. I'm like, oh, thank you, Elizabeth. You're my favorite professor right now, hands down. But anyway, his response was so combative and so aggressive that I would be religious and have the audacity to be a, psychology, a psychologist at the same time as being religious got me thinking, I wonder if this is kind of a problem, especially in higher levels of education where there's this negative view of religion. And so that's where the idea was born. And so went from there and started doing some research on prejudice towards religion. So 
So before we get to the specific topic of prejudice within a religious context, it's important to just kind of understand why this is such an important topic. And on this slide, what I have is just kind of a list of those negative things that we see happen when someone experiences prejudice. So people who experience prejudice tend to have higher rates of unemployment. They have decreased self-esteem. They report less quality of life. And then, do we have a biologist in the room? They could probably explain this better. But it activates the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, your HPA axis. And what that axis does is that it's actually quite beneficial in your life. So whenever you have something bad happen, or something stressful happen, you activate your HPA axis, and it helps you get through the stressful event. The problem is, is if you're activating it all the time, over and over and over again, even when, let's say, multiple prejudice, stressful events in your life, you start having these negative health com consequences. So you have a decrease in your immune functioning, you have higher rates of heart disease, you end up having hypertension, uh, your cognitive functioning decreases, and we also see an increase in mental health problems. So you see increased rates of anxiety and depression and other related mental health issues. So stress is not horrible by itself unless it becomes chronic, right? And that's what we tend to see in people who experience a lot of prejudice. All right, so let's go then to, <laughs> I thought this was appropriate with Halloween coming, right? So. Uh, Prejudice, then, there are a lot of different theories of explaining why people experience prejudice. And in psychology, one of the people who explained a lot of different ideas in social psychology, especially, was Gordon Allport. And he talked about what's called social identity theory clear back in the 1950s. And ever since, it's been one of the leading theories of prejudice and really helps us understand prejudice. And basically, social identity theory has two major components. You have in-group uh, favoritism, and outgroup derogation. So in-group favoritism is the idea that we're nice to people who are part of our social group, right? You're my friend, I do nice things for you, I think you're part of my group, I give you benefits. The outgroup derogation piece then is if I view you as not being part of my group, I don't treat you as well. And there have been many, many research studies where we found that it's really easy to cr create these group processes, right? So you ride on an elevator with someone and then you have to interact with them afterward, you're more likely to give them a benefit than someone else, right? It's that easy to create a group. So these group processes really drive a lot of our lives, but they also drive a lot of prejudice, right? So groups who tend to receive prejudice are groups of people who we tend to view as being different from ourselves and not part of our group. Okay, like Spider-Man here, right? Okay. So let's go then to the context of religion and prejudice. And when we look historically, there are a lot of examples of prejudice towards religious groups, right? You don't have to think very hard to think of them. Just go back to World War II, right? And the prejudice held towards the Jews. Or you can go to Christianity, and you can go to Roman times, and there's horrible persecution there. Or you can actually go modern times, and this is something that people aren't always aware. But if you consider the world as a whole, Christians are actually the most persecuted group. Right, So there's uh, persecution there as well. Uh, or you can also look at the context of Muslims, and we saw a big increase of prejudice towards Muslims, especially after September 11th. Right? But within this, it's always important to take into account your context. Right? And in America, fortunately, Christians don't experience a lot of prejudice, or historically haven't been a targeted group, because America has been viewed as a Christian culture. Oh. Sorry, I forgot this little side note. If you look worldwide, 90,000 Christians were killed last year, primarily in Africa, the Middle East, and North, and North Korea, right? So anyway, so let's talk about the history of religion then, just a little bit in the United States. So the United States has been viewed as a Christian nation, not on paper, but historically, the majority of Americans have been Christian in their faith. And uh, in general, Americans tend to be very, very religious on average. But there's a big shift that's actually going on in religiosity throughout the United States, especially in the last 15 years, we've seen a huge shift in, religi in religiosity. And what we see is the number of people who believe in God or believe in a deity 
has decreased from 90% to 79% in 15 years. When you're talking about social change, that's a huge social change in a very short amount of time, right, to go from 9% to 79%. But then what we're also seeing is among those who still believe in a god or identify as being religious, which is around 70-ish percent of the population, depending on the study you read, they're changing in their religious behaviors as well. So what we see is the unaffiliated person, so the person who says I'm religious but I don't belong to a specific denomination, has increased from 16.1% to 22.8% in the last 15 years. Okay, so we see a big increase there. Church attendance has had a huge plummet, so people who identify as religious don't go to their meeting houses anymore, don't go to church. Uh, they don't value their sacred texts. So if you ask them, if you're struggling with a life problem and you ask religious people, what can you do with them? And you say, can God help you? That's not nearly as common of a response. Can you read your scriptures and get help? Not nearly as common of a response. Do you pray regularly? Doesn't happen as often. So what we're seeing is although the majority of Americans are still saying they're religious, their behaviors don't match up. And so uh, the religiously affiliated, actively practicing individual, so the person who says, I belong to a church, and I practice my church's faith, I do what they say, right, is becoming more of an outgroup in America than it used to be. So according to Gordon Allport in Social Identity Theory, this would become a group of people that would then be prone to experience prejudice on a regular basis. And so that's uh, really the premise of what got this thought process going and what I'd like to cover today with what we've been doing with my research. We've done a series of three studies to assess this question and I'll go through them fairly briefly, but we'll see. All right, before we get to my research, I have to kind of do the background of what research has already done, right? And what's already been found. Uh, the answer is there's not a lot of research. It's just really a topic that hasn't been addressed. Now, when I say that, there's actually a ton of research on if religious people hold prejudice towards other groups, right? And the answer is yes. Right? You can really take any group in society and study them and find they hold prejudices. Right? And when we look at that, we really divide religion in a lot of different ways, but the primary way historically that we've done it is dividing people into intrinsically religious people and extrinsically re religious people. Intrinsically religious people go to church and they believe it. They apply it to their life and they feel like it's really central to who they are. Extrinsically religiously motivated people go to church because it gives them a community, it gives them friends, it gives them social opportunities. Just because someone is intrinsically religious doesn't mean they can't be extrinsically religious. You can be both, right? But what we've done, in, uh, previous people have done with the research when looking at this distinction, they have found that extrinsically religious people tend to hold a lot more prejudice than intrinsically religious people, okay? There's an exception to that. The exception is towards LGBTQ com communities, right? So intrinsically religious people hold more prejudice towards that subgroup. But then most of the other groups that have been studied, extrinsically religious people have more prejudice. <coughs> All right. The other area where there's been quite a bit of research is on prejudice towards minority groups. Okay, so minority religions. So Muslims in America has been really well researched, right? And we know that that prejudice does exist, but again, the area where there really hasn't been research is prejudice towards majority faiths. So this slide goes over what little research has been done on prejudice held towards majority faiths. And the first one is just an easy study where they went in, well, it's a series of three studies. But what these three different studies did is basically ask people to describe Christians, so a majority faith. And these were the words that came up most commonly when describing Christians. So you get pushy, judgmental, narrow-minded, intolerant, and untrustworthy, right? So not really a super flattering list of descriptors. They're the most common ones that come up. Uh, another study, what they did in this study, is they went through social work textbooks that are used in college courses, and they looked in their sections on religion and evaluated the content. And this is what the most common content is when describing religion in textbooks, at least social work textbooks. So rigid, oppressive, hate-filled, homophobic, anti-Semitic, and racist. Right, so again, 
a really great list. <laughs> Not really. But when you looked at those social work textbooks, they were really good at emphasizing the negative aspects that religion brings. And then when it got to the positive piece, it said very briefly on average, it can build a sense of community. And that was it. <laughs> and they really downplayed the positive aspects that religion could have on people's lives. So uh, if we're just looking at kind of general sentiment, we can see that there's just kind of this negative sentiment found towards religion, at least in these few studies. The next study, uh, they went to professionals, and kind of the idea is what we see with religion is that as education increases, religiosity decreases in most, in most faith traditions. There are a couple of exceptions to that, a couple of faiths where as uh, religiosity or as education increases, religiosity actually increases, but those are the exception and not the rule. Okay, so in general, more education, less religious. And so what they want to do in these studies that I have on this third bullet point is they want to ask professionals in different fields how they viewed religious individuals. And uh, as you can see, they had negative uh, views towards religion find, found in social work, in healthcare settings, and in educational settings. Now, the thing is, is just because someone has a negative attitude towards a group doesn't actually mean it always gets translated into problematic behavior. All of us are probably high on what psychologists would call need for cognition. We like to think, right? That's why we picked our professions. We like to think about things. And people who tend to like to think about things, who are high in their need for cognition, tend to not show prejudiced behaviors even towards groups that they don't prefer, right? So you don't like Christians? Well, if you're high in your need for thinking, you tend to not act in a negative way towards Christians, even if you don't like them, right? So <laughs> uh, that's good for us, but when, let's go to this last point here. This is where it becomes really important, is to get beyond what people just think about a group and get to how people actually behave towards a group. That's where it becomes much more problematic. And in these last three studies, what they did is they created applications for graduate school in these three fields, in clinical psychology, medicine, and social work by the three different studies. And what they did with these applications is they manipulated just one piece of the application. So like in one of the studies, they said in their personal statement, I really grew or whatever, I forget the exact wording, but I had this great experience building houses for the needy, and one said through Habitat for Humanity, and one said through a Christian coalition. That was the only difference in the applications, was just manipulating that one religious piece. And across the three disciplines of, the, of these three different studies, they found if you indicated an affiliation with religion, you weren't likely to get into the program. At a significantly lower rate, you got interviews, offers, than those who did not indicate a religious affiliation. Everything else identical in the applications, right? So, that, <laughs> so now we're getting somewhere, right? Now we actually kind of have a behavioral marker. Okay, but as you can see, only three studies and all of them were very similar in that they were just looking at applications to graduate programs. The other area where we see research on prejudice towards religion is just asking religious people, do you experience prejudice? There's a big, big problem with that though. One, self-report is notoriously bad in general, but in this area it's probably worse than other areas because most religions have a martyrdom script that is very popular within the religion, and being a martyr or being a victim of prejudice or other bad acts is actually a sign that you're doing something right in the religion, right? So you think about Christianity and the history of Christianity. The apostles were doing things right and they get killed, right? So it's kind of like a badge of honor within religion to say, oh, I've been persecuted for the faith, right? And so people's self-report can be extra unreliable in this area. But those studies who ask people who are religious if they experience prejudice, they said, well, yeah, we experience prejudice, but again, maybe not the most reliable. So just a few studies there. Okay, so that brings me finally to my research. And I'll try to keep these brief. Like I said, I have three different studies that we've done on this to go through. So the idea of why there would be prejudice towards religious individuals is that there's this shift in society, right? That as America in general becomes less religious, the um, prejudice towards religious groups and actively practicing religious people would increase over time. 
but we can't really go back to previous research studies to see if that's happening because it hasn't been a topic that was even thought of as being important in the past. So uh, other areas we can see those shifts uh, over time, like for example, prejudice towards women has been a really popular topic and we can see an improvement in that there's not this prejudice towards women, especially in the workplace existing today like there was 20 years ago, right? So we can see that because the research has been being done for the last 20 years. But we can't do that with religion and prejudice because no one's really studied it. So we want to be able to go back in history, back in time, and see has there been a shift in how religion has been viewed in our society. And one of the ways you can do that is to look at media. And there's obviously problems there, right? So media partially reflects how society thinks and behaves, but it also influences how society thinks and, and behaves through the process called mediatization. We all shift our views slowly over time based on how media tells us to view the world, okay? But anyway, uh, so we went back and we thought we can see if we had this changing view towards religion by looking at what newspapers have had to say about religion. So we started back in 1997, and then we went in three-year increments. So 1997, 2000, 2003. We did those years specifically to skip 2001 with the terrorist attacks. We thought there might be, for some reason, a big spike in negative reports with religion in that year. So we want to avoid the impact of 2001. So we went uh, to LexisNexis, which is a database that categorizes newspaper articles. And what they do is they have these different categories for any content that the newspaper article might have. So, and one of those categories is religion. And we took the first Saturday paper for each month from three different cities, and we evaluated any article that was flagged as having any religious content. Uh, that gave us actually around 2,900 articles. We ended up removing 300 of those, but so we reviewed 2,663 articles in the final data set. So my undergraduates absolutely love me, right? <laughs> Here's another article. Or so. <laughs> anyway, uh, we selected three cities, Atlanta, Chicago, and New York, the primary newspaper in those cities. And the reason we selected these cities was because uh, what Pew Research found, the Pew Research Foundation has found about religiosity in those cities. Atlanta is one of your most religious cities, right? New York is one of your least religious cities, and Chicago is a nice middle ground. So we want to look and see if the religi religiosity of those cities would predict how the newspapers presented religion. So each newspaper article was coded as either having uh, positive things with religion. So that could be this religion did a charitable act. This religion got an award. This religion is having a potluck, right? Socially positive, happy things, right? And then we had a list of negative things. So this person is a pedophile, and they happen to be filling the church, right? There was a terrorist attack, and they're Muslim. Whatever the case was, was in that article, it was attached to negative content. We assigned it, gave it a category, or uh, quantified as being negative. And then we also had neutral content, where it wasn't clearly positive about the religion. It wasn't really against the religion. And then we ended up removing, like I said, around 300 articles because they were ambiguous. Some aspects of the article were pointing out good things about religion, and other aspects of the article were attaching it to negative things, so it wasn't really a clear one way or the other. Okay, so this is what we found from, uh, in those three different cities. The first block of data is Atlanta, and, you can, and uh, to explain how this graph works, the line of zero would be completely neutral content. So equal numbers of positive and negative and neutral articles to give you an average score of zero, right? Anything above the axis is going to be primarily positive content. Anything below is going to be more negative content. And you can see Atlanta being our most religious city of the group was primarily positive clear across the years we evaluated. You then go to Chicago and you see also positive just until the 2012-2015 year. Right? And then uh, New York, barely positive to begin with and rapidly became quite negative towards religion. And this is actually what we expected to find across the board was this decrease in how many articles associated religion with positive things and an increase in the negative things as religiosity decreased in America. Right? 
Uh, and then we also see in here uh, the differences by city. So they very much reflect the region where they're at. Okay, so uh, what we also did is we took the rating by year and city and said, okay, we have this data for how religious each of these cities are and how they're decreasing in religiosity. Does that predict this decrease in religiosity we're seeing, right? And it actually accounts for a large percentage of the variance as to why religion is uh, the decrease in how, or the, I should say, the increase in the negative response towards religion is really well predicted by the decrease in religiosity in the cities. But we found that the newspapers became negative at a faster rate than just the decrease of religiosity in the cities would predict. So the newspapers are becoming negative faster than just the decrease in religion would suggest it should be, if it was just reflecting society. So if mediatization, which is media influences people, is going to play here, we would expect people to become even more negative towards religion in the future, which has been happening for the last 15 years, so that's a pretty good bet. Okay, so I'm sure a lot of you have been going, well, newspaper articles don't equate prejudice, right? It's just kind of a marker of how people's views have changed over time, right? So then we uh, get to our second study and our third study. In the second study, we did a vignette study. And this is where we asked people, how would you behave towards different people in different situations? So we created four different vignettes. We described someone who is Muslim, someone who is Catholic, someone who is Baptist, and someone who is non-religious. And we worked with different leaders of different faiths to make sure they were accurate. And we had a bunch of fillers in there. So they liked basketball, they had jobs, they were students because we were doing this, this research with college students. So they're going, they have a major, all those different things that college students do. And on the Catholic condition, they also go to mass, right? And uh, similar you manipulations throughout on each of them to indicate that they were the, a religious person and what faith they belong to. Uh, then the other, so we had the th four different conditions, and then we also manipulated the label of a religion, right? So we could have someone described as doing Catholic type things that we would omit or include the label of, I'm Catholic, right? Or the same for the Muslim. And then the non-religious condition, where we have, the con we have a nice control, where there's really no religious content throughout the description of the person, but then we could add in the label of, oh, and I'm atheist, right, to get the atheist condition. It gives us the atheist comparison, but it also gives us the control condition when the label's not present. To assess prejudice, we use the social distance scale, which is a measure where you ask, how comfortable are you with this person doing different things? So how, are you com how comfortable are you for Maria, who was described here, to be your bus driver? How comfortable are you for, with Maria uh, being in your study group? How comfortable are you with Maria being your coworker? How comfortable are you with your best friend dating someone like Maria, <laughs> right? And we use the name Maria because within the Muslim faith tradition, you have to have specific names. So we figured Maria was a name that works within the Muslim tradition that wouldn't be weird with the other conditions. But anyway, uh, that social distance scale has an eternal, internal consistency estimate of 0.93 in this study. That's pretty standard. It's a pretty cohesive scale. Uh, and we gave it to 184 college students, both here and back at King's College and at BYU Hawaii, so at those three different locations. And so um, there's a lot of text up here, I know. I don't expect you to read it all. but. I figured we'd kind of go through the hypotheses and what we found kind of at the same time. So the first hypothesis was that the behaviors of religion would elicit prejudice. And we want to ask that because there's a big debate if it's the actual things that people do that create prejudice or if it's just their status, right? So is it that you're behaving in religious ways or is it because you say I'm religious that evokes prejudice? So we uh, expected the religious behaviors to increase prejudice, which means that the uh, non-religious described group, right, without the label of atheist, would have significantly less prejudice. We didn't find that, okay? 
So the behavior was not significant. The label, though, was very significant. We found, a, well, we're talking social psychology very significant. So it had a moderate effect size, which in social, social psychology research, you're, when you get to a moderate effect size, you're pretty happy. But <laughs> we found that as soon as you added that label to the description of the person, uh, the prejudice scores went up. Right? So people were okay with Maria going to church and praying and doing whatever she wanted to do until she said, I'm Baptist, right? Or until she said, oh, and I'm Catholic, or fill in the blank, okay? So the label evoked a lot of prejudice. Okay, we expected that the prejudice would follow how accepted various religions are, so that uh, there'd be the least amount of prejudice towards the Catholic condition and the most towards the Muslim and the atheist condition. We didn't find that. And that's actually something that's really interesting because not a lot of research has compared these minority religions to majority religions. So all this research that says minority religion status experience prejudice, it might be that it's just religion experiences prejudice because we find it towards Muslims, we find it towards atheists, but when we put it now in comparison with some more common religions like Catholic and Baptist, they're experiencing it too as soon as they say their religious affiliation. <clears throat> okay. Let's see. We also looked at the intrinsic, extrinsic aspect of this. Looking at time, trying to summarize this a bit. And we did find that the intrinsically religious participants had less prejudice than the extrinsically religious people. Okay. And then people being educated about religion or education in general didn't decrease their prejudice towards religion, okay? but their exposure to religion did. But that's really a conflated variable because obviously people who have less prejudice towards religion are going to have more exposure to religious people and religion, so but exposure was effective. Okay, we already talked about this. If you guys want to see the individual stats and the effect sizes, we'll go over that another time. <clears throat> but again, although this is kind of getting more towards a behavioral measure of prejudice by saying, are you okay with this person driving your bus? You're still asking people. And whenever you ask people about their behaviors, people lie, <laughs> unfortunately. But people also just engage in uh, positive, impre uh, positive impression management. They want to look good right? So of course I'm okay with Maria being in my study group, although they might not actually be okay with her being in their study group in real life. So we want to get at an actual behavioral measure of prejudice. But that actually brings us to some, uh, a big question is how do we assess prejudice? And like I said, I want to get to something behavioral, but what's really popular in the field of prejudice right now is something called an implicit association test, an IAT. And the IAT, here I have a picture of one, I think. Let me find it real quick. Yeah, the IAT basically presents you with pictures and words of a stigmatized group, and you have to match them with either positive or negative words, and you counterbalance this, and you go both directions. But the idea is that if you have prejudice towards a subgroup of people, say in this case African Americans, you'll be much faster at attaching them to negative words through a keyboard stroke than positive words, right? And this measure has, it's one of the most popular measures ever, and I might offend some people because there's a lot of research that also suggests that it's not a horribly valid measure. It has a lot of issues with it, and my bias is I fall on the side of I don't feel like it's that valid a lot of times, okay? But what the idea, though, is that you can't lie on this. If you have prejudice, it's going to come out. And so the problem with it, though, is that when people take this measure and it flags them as being prejudiced, it doesn't predict their behaviors. That's really problematic, right? And, what, and so you can take this and it can say you have a prejudice, say, towards African Americans, but then in your actions day to day, you don't act in a prejudiced way. So where the field of went when assessing prejudice and talking about prejudice, where they went after they found they didn't predict these behaviors, they went to a, this concept called microaggressions. And they said, you might not be engaging in huge prejudice acts, but you're acting in minute, aggressive ways towards people, right? So if you have, 
Here's an example of a microaggression. If you have a misogynistic microaggression against women as a man, you might hold the door open for them. And that could be a sign of a microaggression. The problem with microaggressions and the theory of it is that the idea is that it's completely unconscious. So if I was a man and I had misogynistic microaggressions and these innate biases against women, I wouldn't even realize that I'm acting out these microaggressions. But the question becomes is how do we assess that? And the primary way that these have been assessed historically is by asking people. And some microaggressions are just blatant and they're wrong, right? So if I ask someone, where are you from? That actually could be a microaggression, right? But it could just be socially polite and appropriate. Where are you from? But if I ask someone, where are you from? And they happen to look to be of a minority descent. And they say, well, I'm from Oregon. And I say, where are you really from? That's a blatant, horrible microaggression and a sign of prejudice. But a lot of these other microaggressions, holding the door open for someone, how do we know if that's an aggression or not? Especially if you ask the person who did it, and they're unconscious, it's implicit. They don't even know if they have it or not. How do we assess if they're actually prejudiced or not? So that becomes a big problem within this field. And what's traditionally been done is we just ask people of marginalized groups, do you experience microaggressions? Well, we already talked about the limits of self-report. So what we want to do in this study is create a behavioral assessment of a minor behavior, so you wouldn't have the time to think about and go, don't be a prejudiced jerk, right? A minor behavior, and see if people are acting out in minor, minor ways, in a negative way, towards religious individuals. When they don't have the opportunity to stop themselves and think. Oh, we already went through this. Okay, so what we did is we created a study where we lied through our teeth. We used a lot of deception. And we told people that we're doing a study on social interactions in an online format. So come in, we're going to play some, play some games, we're going to get to know someone. And we had them play a card. And so the first part of the game is what we call the induction phase. And in this phase is where they get to know two other people that they're going to be playing a card game with later. And they're just asked a series of questions. What do you like to do on the weekend? Right? And the one player says, oh, I do my studying. I like to watch basketball, and I like to watch movies, whatever. And the other player says, yeah, I study too. I like football, whatever, just some filler answer. And I go to church, right? So we're now manipulating the religious component in one of the two players. And it's in a very subtle way, uh, so participants wouldn't figure out what we were up to, hopefully. And we actually asked participants after the study if they figured out what we were up to. Two of them figured it out, so we took out their data, okay? But we manipulated that, and then after that, they play a card game. And in this card game, there's no real strategy to it. They're just told high card wins, but you don't know who's winning. You don't, because it's computer-based, so you don't see what the other two players are playing, right? So just cards appear, they disappear, you're playing cards randomly. So there's no real gameplay strategy. But here's where the manipulation comes in. We had, uh, throughout the game, the uh, participant would get an attack card or a reward card. And when you got an attack card or a reward card, you had to give one of the other two players either give them five points or take five points away from them, right? A very subtle behavior, more in line with this idea of microaggression. Hopefully, because there's no gameplay strategy, there's not going to be anything other than who do you like more, right? Even on a very unconscious level. Okay, so... Oh, sorry, I meant to go back and fix this. We had 82 participants complete the study, mostly college students. We removed the two that I mentioned who figured out what the study was about. Oh, I really should change the slide. Ignore that, I'll just talk about it. So what did we find? We expected, as because religiously affiliated people are becoming more of an outgroup within society, that they would receive more of the favoritism, right? In group, or, sorry, more of the derogation. Right? Outgroup derogation. And we did find that. The religious individuals were much more likely to be attacked, get attack cards, than the player who wasn't religious. 59% of the time. So if you think about that, they should be being attacked 50% of the time. Right? That's what any player, if there was no bias, should be attacked 50% of the time. They were receiving 59% of the attacks. On the reward side, we see that they're receiving 
my mind's blanking if it's 67 or 63. 64, see, neither of them. 64% of the time, uh, they're rewarding the non-religious player. So the non-religious player is much more likely to receive the favoritism, and the non-religious player is much more likely to receive the derogation. Now, the in-group favoritism is stronger than derogation, and a lot of research has found that. We know that that happens in a lot of areas. And favoritism, in a lot of ways, isn't as problematic from a social standpoint as derogation is, because we all expect favoritism within our social groups. Why do you join a retirement association? You want discounts? You want to tow your car? You want favoritism. Treat me better because I belong to your group, right? Why do you join a union? You want the benefits of the union. So socially, we don't view the favoritism as problematic. The problem is when we start treating other groups poorly because of their group status, which is the derogation piece, which although it wasn't as strong, it was significantly there. OK, and there's the derogation. So then the question is, where do we go with this, and why is this important? Uh, I have a lot of studies of where to go with this, but anyway. Uh, some of the exciting things is, one, is this is, as far as I'm aware, the first actual measure of microaggression that's in vivo. I haven't seen anyone else do something where they actually set up a situation where someone can act out of microaggression. It's this mostly been self-report. So we created this new measure that appears to be working really well. And right now I have another study going on where we're running this concurrently with the IAT to see how the two match up. But anyway, there's that one piece to it. The other piece is, and this is why I have the grayscale on here, is so many things in life are in the eye of the beholder, right? So when we go to this topic of religion, those religious players, when they were being attacked 59% of the time, they were receiving more bias than they should. There was this prejudice towards them. But 50% of the attacks should have been coming their way. So if that individual looks at those 50% of attacks that they should have received as a sign of prejudice, they're wrong, right? On 50 of those attacks, they're only right on nine attacks. And really where we see prejudice today, primarily having its negative effects, is in these microaggressions that creates the activation of the hypotuitary, hypothalamic to pituitary access, HPA access. Oh, where's my brain today? Anyway, when we get that HPA access being activated and we get all those negative health consequences, that's where we see a lot of the negative implications of prejudice. In general, societies become a lot better and we don't say, no, I'm not giving you a job because of your status or I'm going to hate you because of your ethnicity. That doesn't happen as often. I'm not saying that that's not a problem but statistically it's not nearly as common of a behavior. And so these microaggressions is where a lot of people sit, are saying the prejudice is problematic. But again, if you're from one of those marginalized groups and you're looking at every act as an act of aggression, you can actually end up inflicting more damage on yourself than the actual prejudice does. And I'm not saying that to say that these things aren't important and to say that they're not real. I'm just saying that there becomes this balancing act of how do you address it? And taking on, at least in therapy worlds, taking on a victimhood mentality of on being oppressed, it's one of the worst things your client can do, right? So when I work with people and they're the survivor of a horrible uh, incident in their life, we, one of my big uh, goals is to take them from I'm a victim to I'm a survivor and I'm good, right? Well, the same thing applies here. If we take majority religious groups, and we start giving them this line of, oh, there's prejudice towards you, and it's in these minute ways, which does happen, we might actually inflict more damage on people than we actually help them with, if that makes sense. So then the question is, is why is this important and what can we do with it? Well, there's several things that make this important. One is there's already laws that are in place to protect religious groups, right? The thing is, is if you go to trainings on discrimination and on prejudice in general, it's actually the most commonly missed topic in that. We're really good about hitting like LGBTQ issues. We're really good about hitting things like pregnancy, race, don't discriminate on these things. Statistically, we're really bad about hitting religion 
And when we do address religion, it tends to be for minority religions. So we just say, don't discriminate against Muslims, atheists, whatever, but we forget to say in trainings, and don't discriminate against actively practicing Catholics and Baptists, right? And so uh, that's one piece is that we can improve the training. The other piece of why this can be really important for people to understand is uh, not just the policy change, but by understanding this, um, I'm trying to think of how I want to say this. By understanding that this prejudice exists, we're all really good at this need for cognition, generally speaking. We're all thinkers, right? And when people tend to think about things, they tend to not act out in prejudiced ways, right? And since most of us know minority groups are likely to experience prejudice, even if someone has a prejudice, an innate bias that they're not even aware of, that's the idea in the literature right now, at least on the big decisions, they can stop themselves and act in an appropriate way, right? I can stop myself and go, I'm going to do this right. But if you don't recognize a group as, part, as possibly being stigmatized and receiving prejudice, that need for cognition and that cognitive mediation doesn't come into play, and people act out in prejudiced ways, which is probably the concern with this population, is that when it does happen, when the prejudice does occur, that people aren't even aware of this as a, being a group that might receive prejudice, so they don't stop themselves before they act in inappropriate ways. All right, uh, so that's my presentation. That's everything I plan to go over. What questions do you all have? Microphone coming around? It is. Is this working? It's just for the video. It doesn't. Okay, it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay, so I, I have two questions. I have I have about a hundred questions, but I'll only <laughs> ask two of them right now. Um, so. I, I understand your interpretation of the data, um, but a couple of things I need to know. Were you selective in who participated? And what I mean by that is if 70 to 79% of your students were religious, I think what you really showed is that religious people are inherently prejudiced. Um, we, uh, so, no, we, de we definitely assess the religiosity of our participants, mm -hmm. and uh, it depends on the religious nature of the student if they're prejudiced the majority of our participants were not, they were like the average American. They're saying they're religious, but they're not attending church and they're not practicing their religion. The participants who were intrinsically religious were less likely to show the prejudice than participants who are extrinsically religious. But the people who are most likely to show the prejudice were the individuals who had no religious affiliation. So again, that very much goes back to social identity theory and how much are you like me? Yeah, I, but I suppose with the, such a limited number, I'd be in hard, I'd find it hard to believe that 59% or 56% change is significant. But anyway, we can talk about that later. <laughs> um, the second thing uh, is with your first study, um, mm -hmm. what kind of outgroup controls did you do just looking at, because of the change in politics in the United States, things have just overall become more negative. So you're, sh you're showing and equating that change in negativity to a change in relig religiosity. However, that change could purely be due to a change in the tenor of, the, of all, all our of all Of all media. Yeah. And all media could become more negative at the same time. And that's definitely something that needs to be so further. Was, you didn't look at any outgroups of, of another topic. Of, of a topic that wasn't religious at all. And not in this negative. study. Okay. Yeah. So I was, I was thinking about that first study too, the media study, and especially the one where the, the uh, prejudice went from, or the articles went from very positive to very negative in a short period of time. And I was wondering if perhaps that, uh, perhaps it could be accounted for by other things if you looked at things like the publisher of the paper or the editorial policy of yeah. the paper or the owner, the, things like that. And, there, and clearly with that study, I completely agree with both of you. There's a lot of compounds to it. And it could be, like you said, a change in the editor-in-chief of the paper could lead to that decrease right there. What really needs to be done with this study is it needs to be expanded beyond this initial study. But this was just kind of our initial study to see if there is that change in attitude in general towards religion. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Sorry, I, did, I don't mean to dominate. No, but I was fine. really, I was really interested in that process you referred to called medi mediatization, and wondering if there were articles, if there were actual measurements of that process, like the media influencing society. There have been several, multiple studies. Uh, the best one, I, I think his name is Husini. He's in Australia. Uh, I think it's 2009 but did some really beautiful work on how the media impacts people's attitudes over time, right? So it's a two-way street. Uh, hi, I want to uh, clarify, you talked about the micro microaggressions mm -hmm. can deleteriously affect a person with the, the one you had trouble with, the, the thalamic the pituitary, pituitary Hypo, axis, okay. yeah, adrenal so axis. So that, HPA. rather than the overt, let's say, overt aggression like uh, in the card games, the nine times mm -hmm. out of a hundred, which should yeah. not be. So what do you, how, how is that? Unconsciously, it's affecting the microaggressions? I mean, it sounds almost like it's unconsciously done and unconsciously received. And there's two pieces with it. When uh, the big researcher on this is Dr. Sue, and what he uh, says is there's both elements going on. So there, uh, you can go throughout your day as you're receiving these microaggressions, you might not be aware of them, but they have a cumulative effect of creating stress on you. Is the idea? But then there can also be microaggressions that you're aware of. And like I said, the example of where are you from? Oh, but where are you really from? That one's pretty overt, right? And a lot of it de depends on how attuned a person is, right? So uh, I'm guessing most people, I don't know if this is on people's radar, but opening the door for people probably isn't something that people probably think a ton about on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you've read this research and you've read that this is a sign of a misogynistic microaggression towards women, you might have an issue if a guy keeps opening the door for you. And it might become problematic. So it's. It's really microaggressions in general are a poorly defined construct that have become exceptionally broad. And using the example of holding the door open for someone, in one article they're talking about that as being a misogynistic microaggression. In the next article, they're talking about it not opening the door for a Muslim woman is a sign of a religious microaggression towards Muslims. So I, after reading those two articles, I'm like, I don't know what to do. Can I open the door for her or not? Because if I don't open the door for her, I'm against Muslims. If I do open the door for her, I'm against women. And so it's really kind of this really problematic area of research that really hasn't been well-defined, partially why we wanted to create this, create this measure to start delving into that. what you just went through. Um, so when a woman holds the door open for a man, is it a reverse microaggression? Because I'm always aware of it when I do it. It's like, well, normally men do this, but I'm, you know, so how, just take it to the logical absurd. Well, uh, no, and that's, <laughs> and I, that's why I have this issue with this whole construct, is it is poorly, loosely defined, and it expands the umbrella of victimhood beyond what it might need to be, which is why I want to see some nicer measures actually created, which is why we did this one. And the first, the study three that I showed you, that was our initial one. We're now expanding that with other measures and we're running it in four different locations and getting a lot more information to see. received as a microaggression um, are not intended as a prejudice act by the actor. Um, in this is a, one of the more problematic ones where, you know, depending on your upbringing, you might open the door for everybody and that's the way you've been brought up and there's no prejudice involved, but um, the, people can respond as if it were a prejudice on microaggression. And the difficulty within that is the way that microaggressions have been defined as being unconscious by the perpetrator too. So even if you go, and I would say the exact same thing, that the way it's brought up, I hold the door open for everyone. It's just who I am. That's how I do it. And yet, according to the literature, 
I could have these negative impulses, and I'm just not aware because they're unconscious by definition. And so it becomes a really difficult area to actually assess, which is why the IAT became popular, but again, without going into too much depth, it has a lot of psychometric questions as to how valid it is. Rory? Uh, you mentioned that uh, with increase in education, there's a decrease in religiosity, mm -hmm. that word. Um, I wonder, using college students as subjects for this, if there uh, would be an interesting longitudinal study that showed the effect of by simply being in the environment of higher education as part of this, so transition from high school to college, that changes college to the job market, that changes, et cetera, et cetera. Can you measure the impact size of that? Yeah, and uh, that's one of the things that we did assess is how much education had our different participants received, right? But again, excuse me, for using college participants, so, or co college students in general, we did have few that weren't, but in general, the vast majority of our sample was college students. And so we had a very limited range of education, right? And yeah. Well, and that's one of the things that is nice about this population, but also problematic. And whenever you use college students, you have to ask yourself, does this generalize to the rest of the world? probably very limitedly, and it needs to be done with other people, which is what we're pursuing now. But then at the same time, uh, we have seen this decrease in religiosity consistently for the last 15 years, it's become quite prominent. And so there's currently no reason to expect a social change right now. There are certain social markers that tend to lead to increases in religiosity, but we're not seeing those. And so the expectation is that religiosity will continue to decrease in America in the foreseeable future, barring any major natural disasters on an entire U.S. scale, right? But we expect to see that continue to increase. And so kind of the college students are nice in that they're actually not that religious. They might predict the future a little bit better than the general population. So I was just wondering, about that study you mentioned at the very beginning where they, uh, where they had the job applicants um, who experienced prejudice when they mentioned religion on an application. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that had been replicated or could be replicated with other fields. I mean, you're, you're proving that they experienced re prejudice in the academic environment when applying for a graduate degree, but are there other environments where you could see if they are also Expansion. And that needs to be done. It, like I said, this is a horribly limited area. There hasn't been that much research done on it because it's something that really hasn't come on the, on, onto the radar until the last 10 or so years. And so it needs to be done. <laughs> Three studies are interesting, but they're all, like you said, limited because they're all that same setting. Well, thank you so much. It is 5 o'clock, so I want to make sure I cut things off for people who need to travel and go. Um, well, but thank you perhaps all. Robert has a few minutes if you oh, have yeah. questions. Um, but thank you for coming out.